Let's move on now to the session that will be about the strategic alliance between the U.S. and Israel and how to maintain it. It is my pleasure to invite to the stage Let's wait a minute because it, it takes them a few seconds to leave their seats. Dana Stroll, you are the first one to go on the stage, please. Dana is the Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense, Middle East Department of Defense in the United States. Yeah. I'm also honored to invite His Excellency, Ambassador Dr. Dennis Ross, <laughs> former, former Special Assistant to President Obama. And we have yet another distinguished speaker from the United States, His Excellency, Ambassador, another Ambassador, Mark Green, President and CEO of the Wilson Center in Washington. Professor Yossi Shine. Now I'm honored to invite Professor Yossi Shine. Professor Shine, please. Professor Emeritus at the Tel Aviv University, as well as Georgetown University in Washington, and also representative of a Brandeis University in Israel, as well as vice president of Brandeis in Israel. Uh, the uh, panel will be, or the session will be moderated by Udi Segel, senior political commentator and anchor in Channel 13 News from the Sami Ofer School of Media at the Reichman University. Hello, everyone. Hi. Thank you very much. Um, we'll, we'll try to uh, do a little bit about speak about a little bit about uh, the interview with the ambassador and also about the, uh, what you see about uh, the trends in the United States. I want to start by saying that uh, over 30 years that I'm a journalist, I heard over and over these words, this catchphrase about the relationship between Israel and the United States. It's unshakable, it's unbreakable, and it's shared, and we have shared values that it's based on. And I would like to ask you, is it? Is it unshakable, is it unbreakable, and is it still using the shared value according to the trends that we just saw? Uh, Ambassador Dennis Ross is uh, someone that has been here, came back and forth, dealt with the, a lot of uh, government in the, in the Israeli society, right wing, left wings, during the Oslo Accords when there was a real uh, um, conflict uh, inside Israel, and now you can see it also from outside. You've been advised to pre President Ob Obama. Do you think that this internal issue that's going on in Israel is conflicting and have an uh, implication on the Israeli-American relations? Look, you could not have done what I've done for as long as I've done it uh, unless you're basically an optimist, right? You always see what can be done you rarely uh, are going to be deterred by the nature of the problems or the difficulties. When I look at the U.S.-Israeli relationship, uh, the fact that it has endured for so much of Israel's history, I say that by, when I say so much of Israel's history, I say it because if you look at the first few administrations after Israel became a state, uh, Truman immediately recognized Israel over the opposition of his entire national security establishment. The Eisenhower administration viewed Israel basically as a problem. Uh, John Kennedy was the first president to sell arms to Israel, and he did it over the, again, the opposition of the State Department and the CIA. The Pentagon had evolved a little bit at that point. I say this because the beginnings, the first, you know, at least the first 15 years of the relationship Israel did not have this close relationship with administrations, although it had support from the Congress. And it had support primarily from the Democrats in the Congress. So this notion that uh, the relationship has, has always had this in, enduring, unbreakable uh, character to it 
really dates from later in the relationship. But what's interesting is once it really takes on a life of its own, and it really starts in the Reagan administration, John Kennedy was the first to refer to the relationship as a special relationship, but it was really Reagan uh, with the creation of strategic cooperation in 1984 that creates a whole new baseline. And presidents who follow Reagan, Republican and Democrat, maintain that even if they may not share the same emotional attachments to Israel, they still treat this as a baseline. Now the key that underpins all of this is shared values. You have people, I, I referred to the Congress, you have people in the Congress who may have zero to very few Jewish constituents who have been strong supporters of Israel. Why? And you saw it in the polling here. Because Israel is a democracy. So if you call into question whether Israel is a democracy, it's bound to have an effect on shared values, which have always been the key pillar of the relationship. It was in the Reagan administration, ironically, where the, the emphasis became one of not just shared values, but shared interests, because we saw Israel as a strategic asset for the first time. So shared interests and shared values are both pillars, but shared values has been the key that has underpinned it. And again, I want to echo something that Tom Knight says. And I say this because I'm, I'm speaking on a lot of college campuses. If anybody questions whether Israel is a democracy, all you have to do is take a look at what's been happening here. Nowhere in the world have you seen a manifestation of the, not only the ethos of democracy being deeply rooted, but that it has a grassroots character. These demonstrations for 20 weeks have been extraordinary, not only because of their size, but because of their endurance, and because of what it says about the Israeli public's commitment to democracy. So anything that would call into question that, that would have an effect on the ironclad nature of the relationship. But I don't, I don't see that happening right now. Right. Um, Ms. Dana Stroh, I want to ask you, as someone that is now an uh, official in the, the Biden administration, Ambassador Knight said, see the people in the streets. This is a vivid democracy. So people can ask themselves, and also people that support the Prime Minister Netanyahu, you know, all we are doing is dealing with, I don't know, the uh, how to elect judges in Israel, and the United States is dealing in our internal, internal uh, infrastructure. What do you make of what's happening in Israel through the eyes of Bi the Biden administration? Well, first of all, you, in your initial description, missed the Pentagon's favorite word for describing this relationship, which is ironclad. Okay, thank you very much. So the first point I want to make is from a Department of Defense perspective, how unshakable, unbreakable, deep, and ironclad. And we make a point of having every, our cabinet level officials, every statement, it's usually the first or second sentence you see. Because it's not just what we're doing internally between the Israeli Ministry of Defense, the Israeli Defense Forces, and the US Department of Defense internally to strengthen our military cooperation and cooperate together across the region. Uh, we want the world to know it. And we want everyone in the region, our partners and our adversaries to know how ironclad and unbreakable this bond is and this relationship is. In terms of US values, I'm gonna speak very specifically from a Department of Defense perspective because I think shared values in our military relations is equally important to what you heard Ambassador Ross say. So commitment to mitigating civilian harm in military operations, adherence to the law of armed conflict, working together to address human suffering, which can affect the security and stability of the state of Israel. These are conversations, uh, civilian control of the military, the most basic value for, for a military uh, from the United States and shared by the state of Israel, are critical and fundamental to the mutual commitment to continue to advance and increase military op cooperation and, and, and interoperability together. And again, this is something administration after administration, you heard Ambassador Ross talk about the changes in administration, but what, what doesn't change and what continues to advance is that, is that commitment to strengthening the, the, the relationship. So, so I would like to ask Ms. Stroll, you know, you know as, as, as a deputy assistant at the Department of Defense in the United States, you're saying 
we want to know, to everyone knows that it's an iron cloud and this is the shared values and that we have an unbreakable and unshakable. How that goes with the fact that the Biden administration, the White House, haven't called Prime Minister Netanyahu for a meeting for over six months after he was elected? Isn't that signals the opposite? So I'm going to have to refer that question to the White House. <laughs> but listen, for me, it's not about just every meeting. It's about the constant, the, the architecture and the strategic depth of this relationship. On any given month, there are hundreds of interactions between the US and the Israeli government. We just accomplished a few months ago the largest military exercise, Juniper Oak, in the history of our two militaries. Thousands of personnel participating, uh, increasing that military cooperation. When we tell Secretary Austin it's time to call Minister Gallant, no questions asked. It's an, we understand the importance of this relationship. General Carrillo, I think he's been to Israel five times uh, just this year. So the commitment uh, in the Department of Defense and across our armed forces is truly enduring uh, and, and, and ironclad. All right, Ambassador Green, do you think that the gap that we have between the American uh, administration right now and the government of Israel in various issues, including the judicial overall and other stuff, do you think it will I impact on this bond and also about the um, uh, legitimacy in the United States of the involvement of the, of the American uh, administration in the Middle East for Israel? There's a lot in that question. Let me uh, pull it apart a little bit. First off, uh, I agree with what others have said. Uh, I think the bond between the U.S. and Israel is unbreakable. I think it has been. I think it continues today. Is it uh, shakable? Sure. And democracies are messy. So, of course, there's lots of talk back and forth. Quite frankly, there is because we care. The U.S. cares about Israel. The American people care about the Israeli people. So sure, there's lots of talk and chatter back and forth. But the underlying relationship is absolutely uh, unbreakable. You know, when I see these numbers uh, and we have a discussion like this, what it points to for me is that we sometimes fail to do the job of remaking the case. Why does this matter? Uh, I think we sometimes take for granted that a new generation of Americans, a new generation of Israelis, know the history, know where it's come from, know why it matters. Shame on us. We need to remake the case over and over again. And how deep that relationship is. So uh, before I got to the Wilson Center, I used to be the administrator of USAID. So we signed an MOU with Mashav, Israel's counterpart to USAID. Why? Because we are joined at the hip in trying to improve development outcomes and lift lives and communities around the world, working together because we look at the world the same way, because each side brings something to the table. And that kind of work together, to me, is the clearest expression of shared values that I, ha that I can possibly express. So. I think there are plenty of examples of the unbreakable bond, the shared relationship, but I do think we have to be careful. I do think we need to make the case. We need to talk about the history. We need to talk about those constant uh, uh, interactions between the US and Israel in defense matters as well as in diplomatic matters. And if we don't, uh, I do worry that in the future, we'll see more and more uh, young people not truly appreciating how important it is strategically, culturally, and socially to both countries. Professor Shane, you know, when we look at the uh, trends uh, and, and following uh, Ambassador Green's um, conclusion about the young generation, it's about us. Israel is not doing well uh, in young Democrats. So what do we do wrong and what, uh, how can we fix it if, as this poll says, and as if every one of us is saying, this is the most important connection that Israel has with any country around the world. Look, you have three officials here. 
Some are still in office, some have been. They're incredibly polite, and they're very, you know, careful in their words. And that's part of what you have in Washington. I spent 20 years in Washington, and this is what you hear. One should not underestimate the avalanche of feelings and agony in Washington and beyond. What we are seeing here cannot be a perpetuum mobile, as if we're going to continue unshakable and unbreakable, as if kind of like we are speaking, as if something always has to be. Let me read you a quote from a guy that you will recognize or he will recognize himself. Israel will have to deal with its secular religious divide and its demographic issues, but it's shown its capacity to cope with its problems. You know who said that? A guy named Dennis Ross. Dennis Ross wrote a brilliant book, Doomed to Succeed. And this is the last page of Dennis Ross's book. Dennis is a good friend of mine for years. And Dennis has known this place for really very intimately. What we have seen is what we call, Putnam has called, a two-level game. Democracies function not only by strategic interest, but by their domestic affairs. We have heard Professor Reichman this morning, we have heard Amos Gilad begging for the ambassador to stay. Israel has known an unimaginable shift in the last few months that no one should underestimate. We are now bragging about the people in the streets as if they are the symptoms of Israel democracy. But don't forget that the government of Israel regards these people in the streets as anarchists and are those who are breaking democracy. So one should understand. One should understand. And I've been, I've privy to these relations for decades. These are relations that will not be continued if Israel will behave the way we have seen in the last four months. Israel has been changing. We have radicals in our midst, those who do not appreciate democracy, liberal values, or do not understand. It's not Shikli. It's not Vaturi who does just say, mind your own business. These are nasty. Nasty, and I don't want to say anything more. People who do not understand the subtleties of Israel in the international affairs and the fact that the margins of error of Israel are so really uh, 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 narrow in comparison to the United States. So what I'm saying is, it's a double-edged sword. We have here America changing, we have Israel changing, and the ambassador was talking about the, the young generation. And anyone who takes for granted this kind of support, as if it's always will be there. Dennis has written about Truman and Eisenhower and all those things. We can go into the abyss if we don't maintain our democracy and our society because we will not be any more attractive. And as they say, you know, Alevi said last time when he came after the Yom Kippur War to America to ask for weapons. And he described it like this, that he came to American official, the head of the Mossad, and he asked him, he said, you know, like after the Yom Kippur three days and we were almost empty, and he said he was asking me questions and questions and questions. I said, I said to him, why are you asking all these questions? We need this. He said, we want to be that we are with the winners. And America wants to know that they're with the winners and with the, those who are espousing their own values. So don't underestimate. <laughs> Ambassador Ross, you know, he got you by the quote. <laughs> and, and I want to ask you it's if a, maybe, if ba maybe you are too, if maybe, maybe you are too polite or maybe too American to say <laughs> to the Israelis in this, uh, you know, in a very direct way, you're not behaving yourself. So, do you think that the American administration, with the fact that uh, Benjamin Netanyahu was not invited to the White House uh, six months after he was elected, by other uh, signals that they are signaling us are telling us something that we do not understand because we are more, more favorable of the direct way of talking? So let, there's a duality here. <laughs> uh, on the one hand, what, what Dana was saying, you shouldn't mistake. There is a relationship, a professional relationship yeah. between the, the Defense Department uh, and different arms of the Israel, different arms of the American government, including AID, with Israel's counterparts, where we see something fundamentally in America's interests. You know, when Reagan made the decision for strategic cooperation, the argument was, 
wow, Israel gives us the equivalent of another one or two aircraft carriers. So there's an understanding. Everyone who tends to threaten Israel also tends to threaten the United States. So that drives a, a strategic interest. So that's real. I've responded to your question by saying, but the pillar of, strategic, of shared values is what was the source of the relationship to begin with. If you call into question those shared values, and by the way, that's what the polling seemed to suggest, including Israeli public recognition of that. If you call into question the shared values, then you're calling into question one of the pillars yes. that underpins the relationship. That's a fact. You quoted, it's from the book, my book called Doom to Succeed. There is on a page earlier, I, I actually, I actually always, say. There no, always is. No, yeah, the page you, if you get quoted, yeah. then you get the right to quote back. <laughs> Interesting enough, you'll see, you'll, go, you'll see, I actually say. I read it. Right. Well, I, one of the things I say is that, look, the relationship is enduring because all the factors that drive us together. But I also said, and you can go back and see this, if Israel weakens the Supreme Court, if it passes illiberal legislation, mm -hmm. if it adopts a position where it excludes the possibility of a two-state outcome, that will have an effect on the relationship. I wrote those words in 2015. So it's not, there, there's a reality. And again, that reality comes back to the shared values. The shared values are the most important element that underpins the relationship. The shared interests came after the shared values. Now, the shared interests will help sustain it, for sure. And the reality that people are in the streets, there, there is a grassroots democracy here, that's unmistakable for everybody to see. The Israeli public is responding. I look at the polls here that say consistently 70% of the Israeli public, at least 70% of the Israeli public wanted a dialogue, want a compromise, don't want these reforms or the overhaul imposed. 70%, now normally, I like to joke, normally 70% of the Israeli public can't agree whether it's day or night. <laughs> but they can agree that on this issue, this needs to be worked out on the basis of a consensus and not imposed. Well, that's a reflection of understanding the importance of democratic values. I also want to comment on something I was struck by by the survey, which is about millennials and the work we need to do to educate the next generation. But we all, millennials are questioning America's engagement in the world writ large and all of its strategic departments, uh, d strategic relationships, and, and what that fundamental role is. And you see it in the very vigorous debate uh, in, in uh, American society, but also in Congress about what the nature of the U.S. role is in the world and enforcing or upholding the rules-based international order, how we work with allies and partners. Israel is certainly one of those. So I just want to share a reflection. I'm going to put on my old uh, Senate staffer hat. So in the Middle East, including Israel, you know, if you think about a pie chart of U.S. assistance, economic assistance, uh, security assistance, the Middle East takes up like the majority of that pie chart economic, military, et cetera. I thought as, as, as the Middle East senior professional staffer in the Senate that I would be spending my time explaining to constituents in different groups why we should uphold and maintain and increase assistance to the Middle East. But really a lot of the conversation is why give assistance at all? What is the US taxpayer doing? What does it do for America to have this kind of assistance? Um, and the reason I want to share that is because it is okay in, our, in the American system to question our relationships, to question the assumptions underpinning them. We actually have a resilient system of congressional oversight of assistance, congressional oversight of foreign policy, a strategic direction, and an executive branch, and we have a very, very robust, sometimes exhaustingly robust, interagency process for developing our strategies, questioning our strategies and engagement in the world, and then updating them. And so just because Americans are questioning the U.S.-Israel relationship at times is not in and of itself a fundamentally negative thing. I actually think it's quite healthy in a democracy. So I, I think it's an important point here. And I also think it's okay for Israelis to question the United States. But then let's look at the votes. 
So even if we have young people questioning, Republicans or Democrats questioning, and showing up at different places in the survey, at the end of the day, large bipartisan constituencies in both the U.S. Senate and the U.S. House vote year after year to advance and deepen this relationship. And they're representing the American people. The largest, most historic memorandum of understanding for security assistance, over $3.1 billion a year for Israel, plus an emergency $1 billion in 2021, the first year of the Biden administration, to support Israel's Iron Dome after Operation Guardian of the Walls. Consistent votes over and over to advance and deepen this relationship. So yes, at times there is a debate in our open society, in the media, in, in Twitter, or whatever comes after Twitter. But also at the end of the day, I think what you, you see the actions and the measurements of American commitment and investment, not only because of the shared values, also because this is an important relationship for the United States. It's mutually beneficial. And when members of Congress or when different organizations or when uh, representatives of the media ask those questions, when each administration comes in and examines its, its, its relationships, they all reach the conclusion that the U.S.-Israel relationship matters fundamentally for both peoples, both governments, and both states. I would like to take uh, the advantage of, uh, and thank you to, to your uh, current hat, as the, the, yes, the new hat, and also to uh, take advantage of the, the thing you said about Israel is questioning Americans, and to question the fact, you know, one of the, the shared interests that Israel and the United States has is the Iranian threat. Do you have strategy? Do you have real strategy regarding Iran? Do you have, for example, we, all, we, hear, we hear administration after administration speaking about uh, diplomatic means and how we will deal it with sanction. As a member of the DOD, do you have a military plan to tackle Iran and to get rid of their nuclear weapons if all diplomacy fails? So first of all, I want to reiterate and underscore what you hear from all of our most senior leaders uh, in the U.S. government, which is President Biden has said Iran will not acquire a nuclear weapon and he means it. He means it and he says it and he said it here uh, when he came to visit Israel last year and he continues to make sure that his administration retains immediate credible military options. So President Biden has also been clear that his first choice is diplomacy to address, to address Iran's nuclear program. But Secretary Austin's job is to ensure that the president has other options available should diplomacy fail and my team spends a lot of time ensuring that there's a credible military option. So first, yes. But then there's other facets to how we're working on both deterring Iran, countering Iran, constraining Iran. Some of it includes working with allies and partners, especially across the region, which is why you hear us talk a lot about integrated deterrence, interoperability, stitching together our air defense systems, our maritime coalitions to push back on Iran. It's why we're investing, especially with Israel, encounter drone technology and techniques because of how fast Iran is proliferating those. We work uh, on countering Iranian support for terrorism across the region, upholding Israel's freedom of action across the region, including very specifically in Syria. We're working to counter Iran's uh, cyber malign activities. And right now, of course, we're spending a lot of time working with our allies and partners on, on countering Iranian-Russian deepening military cooperation, which not only is every day killing Ukrainian civilians and devastating Ukrainian civilian infrastructure, but will have profound implications for Israel and Israel's neighbors in this region if we don't start preparing to counter that now. Thank you. Ambassador Green, do you think this shared interest uh, of Israel and the United States regarding Iran um, can really work together because it seems like Israel is, is saying for years this is a danger that is coming. Now we can see that the cooperation between Iran and Saudi Arabia, we can see that China is getting inside the, the, the Middle East and maybe, um, as uh, Ms. Dana Stuhl said, the overall questioning of the American citizen about uh, their job in the region it's actually a one that is shared between Trump and Obama and maybe Biden that the United States 
is going back home, is taking its forces and its, uh, its assets from the Middle East, and we as Israeli needs to get to this new reality. Well, let, let me broaden out a little bit the point that Dana was making. Uh, the numbers that we saw before are snapshots, right? There are, there are moments in time. They're not only moments in time, but they're crafted questions that look merely at the bilateral relationship. We're not living in a time when bilateral relationships are the only things that matter. We see huge influences and trends going on in the world right now. And President Biden is dealing with strategic competition looking towards Asia. President Biden is dealing with Putin's invasion of Ukraine and how all of these factor in together. So I think that from the U.S. perspective, we're also looking at our allies and realizing the importance and value of allies, perhaps more than we have in quite some time. And I think that uh, plays to Israel's advantage. Clearly, Israel, the U.S.-Israel alliance, again, based upon shared experience and shared values, is extremely important at a time when it matters. A and the fact that we're seeing Iran cooperate so closely and supply weapons and equipment to uh, Russia is only a, a reminder of that. It sort of draws a bright line under it. So I think the actions of these larger trends are making the U.S. and Israel even closer on many of these decisions. Professor Shane, can we trust that the United States is here for decades to come in the Middle East? Or you can see this, there is a trend. The United States is not the police officer of the world anymore, or it's a police officer when it really needs to be. Maybe now it's mostly Ukraine and China and not uh, these guys that's doing mess in the Middle East. Look, we haven't talked about Many elephants are in the room. There is one big elephant in the room. We talked about Israel and its democratic character and so on. We didn't talk about the American democratic character. The American democratic character also underwent a tremendous <coughs> shift. Dennis finished his book in 2015. We had Trump in power. A president was impeached twice. A president was accused of trying to take over the Capitol Hill. We have a bifurcated America. It's not by mistake, and think about it, the intricacies between Israel and the United States, that Netanyahu, for example, is just waiting that the Republican administration will come to power, which will give him all the wings he needs. He will not hear the language that Dennis talks about the judicial reform. If you talk to DeSantis, if you talk to Senator Cutton, I call this office to say, what does it mean, Senator Cutton, when you blame the Israeli public getting money because of their anarchistic behavior from the American administration? You will not get this kind of a support, and the bifurcated country is also America. The culture war that we have here is, of course, in a different fashion than the culture war that Americans are, are witnessing. They're witnessing deep, deep-seated kind of culture war, and that impacts their foreign policy. We have seen the Trump administration come to power and basically nullifies everything that the Obama administration did in, 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 in a second. That's what he said. Everything he did, I will nullify. The second point, and this is, has to be taken into consideration, Israel has also known, for example, many of the influences that we see in Israel are coming from America. One should not underestimate the conservative views in America that has penetrated Israel under the banner that we are bringing the fights of America against the liberals into the Israeli equation. And what does it mean to bring it to the Israeli equation without noticing that we have a totally different realm? So all those expenses that you see, and I'm not talking about all those think tanks that have been created here, to undermine the Israeli judicial system have come from America also. So this is a much more complicated picture that we are painting. It's because the United States is also not a unified body. And I would also say that because of that, one should not see it as a continuum. Of course, the, 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 the administration, uh, the, the State Department, the, the, uh, especially the Pentagon, the intelligence, all of those agencies are working. And we still hope that in Israel they're working because this is what we are, we, are, we are hoping it will work because this is really what secures Israel and also secures the notion of, of, of shared interest. But lots of things can also change in my opinion. 
and we have seen it with the United States and other countries, and we hope that we will get it together and will understand this kind of like complexities, and uh, after understanding it, we will be able to put it together. Ambassador Ross, I would like, I would like to ask you, you, you know, as, as, as a veteran of the Middle East, um, what do you make of the fact that yesterday, we've seen Zelensky at the Arab League, but we saw one of the guests in the Arab League was the mass killer Bashar al-Assad. So he killed 700,000 people of his own people. America went to some extent against Bashar al-Assad. He got the support of Russia and now he's sitting there as equal between equals. What does it make about shared interest and shared values? Well, I, I don't think that, that the, the Arab League meeting was an example of, of, of uh, shared values. <laughs> Well, I spoke here about interest. Yeah, I'm not even sure it was so much an indication of shared interests. Uh, the argument that some are making in the Arab world is, look, we, we tried it your way, uh, and things just keep getting worse. There's a terrible drug problem that basically drugs help to provide the money to underpin the Assad regime. I think there's a number of Arab states who are thinking maybe we can wean Assad off of that. Uh, you know, it's not like they think there's going to be a transformation of Assad. It's not like any time Assad makes a commitment, he ever lives up to a commitment. I don't think they have any illusions. They're saying, all right, we're going to try something different and we'll see if it works. It won't work. There's not a chance it will work. Uh, Assad is incapable of changing. Uh, there is no possibility you can wean him away, wean him off of the Iranians or the Russians. He's in power because of them. So. It's part and parcel of what is the general approach we're seeing among a number of the Arab states who are saying, let's hedge our bets. We don't quite know what the future is going to be. Let's hedge our bets. Uh, we'll reduce the possible points of friction. You know, and what you're going to see as a result of that is very little change. Uh, the fact that we see this, I think, should bother all of us from the standpoint this guy is a, is a war criminal. He shouldn't be accepted by anybody. Uh, the last thing that should happen is there should be any reduction of isolation of him. But this effort to reduce the isolation won't change the behavior and it won't stop the flow of drugs across the border. It won't change the American administration uh, policy regarding Syria and Assad? I don't see it. Well, Dana can tell you that. <laughs> yes. But I would be, I would, I'll put it this way. Yes. Since I'm not in the administration, I would be shocked to see any change. Uh, towards Assad by the administration. The administration is not going to embrace Assad in any way, shape, or form. So I made it easy for you. <laughs> <laughs> um, number one, what this administration has said its approach to Syria on is one to increase uh, humani and expand humanitarian aid to the long-suffering Syrian civilians, to maintain ceasefire lines, there have been lower levels of conflict in Syria for years. Three, maintain U.S. force presence in eastern Syria and around the Atomf garrison, specifically to work with local partners to achieve the enduring defeat of ISIS. And four, uh, to take steps to ensure accountability for Assad and his terrible war crimes and atrocities against the Syrian people. None of that is going to change, despite the fact that Assad, and I wouldn't call him equal among equals uh, at, the, at the Arab League, and I agree with Dennis, uh, we'll see what can actually happen. I do think um, we are at an interesting inflection point uh, in the Middle East where many of our partners are choosing to pursue their own courses of diplomacy to address issues. So you see it in the uh, Saudi-Iran uh, decision to reestablish diplomatic relations, in the Arab League decision to welcome Assad back in. Uh, you see it in, in many other manifestations of, of, of the region working to de-escalate. You heard Ambassador Nide say calm is good. So if some of these can, can de-escalate and open up avenues for diplomacy, the Biden administration is not gonna stand in the way of those efforts. But I think what's really important to emphasize here is that President Biden has been clear that he is not going to normalize with Damascus, and he is not going to loosen or lift 
the extensions, extensive sanctions regime that has been imposed on the Assad regime for their war crimes and crimes against humanity. And meanwhile, uh, the commitment uh, to work with over 80 countries in a global coalition to defeat ISIS, in, that includes NATO, will stay. So U.S. forces are committed to staying in Syria and continuing to work with local partners to defeat ISIS. Uh, I don't expect Assad to all of a sudden become a partner in those efforts. And frankly, our Arab countries, uh, our Arab partners that uh, did make this decision with respect to the Arab League, share many of the same interests as we do in ensuring that ISIS cannot reconstitute and terrorize the region. Uh, and we will work with them to see if they can improve humanitarian access for the Syrian people. I just want to ask you one more question, uh, the Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense, Dana Stroll. A few months ago, President Biden said in an interview that the United States will not supply the F-16s to Ukraine. Yesterday it happened. What happened in between? What made you supply the F-16s to Ukraine? And do you fear this uh, uh, this thing that you're doing there, uh, increasing the support militarily of Ukraine, will drag President Putin, uh, uh, Putin of uh, Russia, uh, dealing with stuff with that we don't want to speak about, that he spoke about a few times in the past, uh, nuclear things that he will maybe use to deter the West and the United States. Well, you heard Ambassador Nides talk about, you know, who knows how this ends, but what, what the United States has been focused on is, is working with a broad coalition of allies and partners to ensure that the Ukrainian people and the Ukrainian armed forces have what they need to defend their people and their territory. And you've seen this in announcement after announcement from this administration, drawing down from our own stockpiles, uh, as well as working with our partners to get as much security aid uh, to the Ukrainian people as possible, um, including extensive amounts of defensive aid. Thank you very much. I will hope you enjoyed this discussion, and thank you very much for the distinguished guest. Thanks.